Okay, uh, then let's continue with the uh, Lewis acid and base theory. Um, in the last class, I have illustrated how Lewis acid and base theory relates to uh, molecular orbital uh, theory. And uh, before, I need, yeah, see the transcript. Yes. Sorry, I forgot that. All right, um, <clears throat> so now let us um, apply what you have learned in the last class to a few examples. So we have determined that the, the relative energy of homos on, and glumos of the um, donor and the acceptor respectively determine what kind of stative uh, covalent bond we form, if we even form a covalent bond. So for instance, um, we could wonder how um, water <clears throat> may react with, with calcium. You see here the homo and the lumo of the water, and you see here the homo and the lumo of the, of the calcium. So based on the relative of the energies, what would we expect? Would we expect um, a Lewis acid base reaction, yes or no? And if you um, expect a Lewis as a base reaction, what kind of bond would you expect to form? Would you expect to form a completely covalent bond or would you expect a polar covalent bond? And if it's polar, in which direction would it be um, polarized? So now <clears throat> let us do these examples together. So when looking at the homos and glumos of water and calcium respectively, First question is, would you expect a Lewis as a base reaction between these, or would you expect another reaction, or would you expect no reaction? You are invited to provide suggestions. Any ideas? All right, then I will help you a little bit. So we see that the homo of the calcium is significantly higher in energy than the lumo of the water. So if there was a Lewis as a base reaction, we would certainly expect that the calcium will be the donor and the water will be the acceptor. So now um, we have to decide, well, will there be partial electron transfer to form a covalent bond or will the electron transfer practically complete? So now that all depends on how we interpret the energy difference between the homo and the lumo. So in this case, the energy difference is large enough so that there's practically a complete electron transfer. Okay, so we would therefore transfer the electrons from the calcium to the water and that would refer to a redox reaction. So we would oxidize the calcium and we would reduce the water. So this is also consistent with what we experimentally observe. When we add calcium to water, then there's a redox reaction and we form um, calcium hydroxide and um, hydrogen. So um, using the molecular orbital picture, we can um, fuse the reaction the following way, we first transfer for the electrons from the calcium to the water. But these electrons will then be in an interbonding, in the interbonding lumo of the water, where they actually be stabilized the water molecule. So the water molecule disintegrates and forms hydroxide ions and hydrogen gas. Okay. So this is a way to fuel the reaction. Oh, we have a guest here. Yeah. Butterfly, beautiful. Well, hopefully it doesn't kill itself <laughs> in the light. 
All right, Ravi, can I do really anything about it? Okay, let's go to another example. Um, let us assume we have a reaction between hydrogen and, and chloride. Would we expect uh, a Lewis as a base reaction? Or would we expect a redox reaction in this case? Sorry? Yes, a Lewis as a base reaction. That is that is that is correct. And this is because the home of the chloride ion has approximately the same energy than the lumo of the water. So again, the chloride would act as a donor and the H2O molecule would act as an, as an acceptor. So now this kind of interaction in this case has a different name. So when you add chloride ions to water, um, then of course there's not a real reaction, but there's nonetheless an interaction in form of hydrogen bonding, okay? So hydrogen bonding can be viewed as a Lewis acid base interaction between, for instance, a halogenide and the water molecule. Okay? So an electron transfer at the water molecule, or no, sorry, uh, electron, electron pair at the chloride molecule would make an interaction with a uh, uh, Lewis acid base type interaction with the hydrogen atom of the, of the water. So in, in this sense, a high hydrogen bonding can also interpret it as a kind of loose acid base reaction. Okay, now let's go to another example. Let's consider an interaction between a magnesium two plus ion and a water molecule. So in this case, would you expect a loose acid base interaction? Yes or no, and if so, which species would be the donor and which species would be the acceptor? Yes. Yes, so in this case, uh, the H2O would be the donor and the magnesium plus would be the acceptor. We can see this from the fact that now the homo of the water molecule has about the same energy than the LUMO of the magnesium 2 plus. So it would expect the partial electron transfer from the water molecule to the magnesium 2 plus ion leading to a covalent uh, dative bond. And this is also exactly what we experimentally observed. When we add magnesium ions into water, then we form um, an aqua complex in this case, a hexa aqua complex in which six water molecules surround the magnesium ion. Okay, um, now let us consider a final example. Let's consider an interaction between um, a water molecule and a fluorine molecule. So, would you expect a redox reaction or not? Uh, sorry, and lose as a base interaction or not? And how would the electrons be transferred? Any ideas? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, it would be redox reaction, correct? And in this case, the the electrons would be transferred from the water to the to the fluid. So the the water molecule would be oxidized, and the fluorine molecule would be would be reduced. So we can again 
to the reaction the following way, you transfer the two electrons from the water to the fluid molecule, but then these two electrons go into an interbonding molecular orbit and destabilize the fluid molecule. And we actually get, get, get fluoride. So the, the fluid and fluor bonds break apart to make uh, fluoride. And the water molecule gets, gets oxidized to form, um, in this case, uh, HOF. So the reaction products in this HOF are but HF, hydrogen fluoride, and HO, A, sorry, OF2, okay, um, oxygen difluoride. All right, um, now let us leave the, uh, the uh, Lewis acid and base theory and go to another Lewis acid base concept, which is the hard and soft acid and base theory. So the hard and soft acid and base theory can be understood as a refinement of the Lewis acid base theory. So we can distinguish between hard and soft Lewis acids and hard and soft Lewis bases. Okay. And by classifying these species hard and soft, we can make predictions about um, the reactivity, and we can predict the stability of Lewis acid base adducts, including, including salts. So it is not immediately obvious what we actually mean by a hard acid or a hard uh, base or a soft acid or a soft base. So let us clarify um, these terms. So to begin with, what would be meant by a hard or a soft um, Atom. So the term hard and soft relates to polarizability. Okay, so hard means little polarizable, and soft means easily polarizable. So how do the terms hard and soft uh, relate to um, polarizability? Um, we can say that when we have uh, well, little polarizable um, atom, then it's actually difficult to deform the electron cloud when we apply an external electric field. So this is systematically shown here. So here we have an unpolarized atom. So in that unpolarized atom, the negative charges of the electron cloud is um, well homogeneously distributed. So now when we have um, an external field applied to this atom, then that electron cloud will deform, okay? And it will deform so that basically the charges um, tend to move to the positive end of the electric field. And well, um, the, at the same time, the negative charges of the electron cloud will be repelled by the, by the negative end. And so, the ease of deformation of that electron cloud now relates to hard and soft. So easy deformation is uh, something which is easy to deform can be considered soft and something which is um, um, difficult to deform can be considered hard. So this is how the terms hard and soft relate to the polarizability of a particular atom. Okay. Then what is a hard or soft acid and what is a hard or soft base? So as I mentioned already before, we mean by hard and soft acid, a hard and soft Lewis acid, which would be an electron pair acceptor, and the hard or soft base, which would be an electron um, pair um, donor. So what is this concept useful um, or we can, as I said also previously, use it to classify Lewis acids and bases, and we can make statements about the bonding in the um, Lewis acid base adducts and, and salts. So um, we can decide whether the um, interactions are strong or weak, depending on well, which species we combine. And we can also make statements about 
the covalency or the ionicity of the Lewis acid base interactions. Okay, so what are the trends here? So, as a trend, when we have hard heart interactions, then these are usually strong and they are usually more ionic. However, exceptions can apply. And when we have soft soft interactions, then these are also usually strong. And they are, however, in this case, mostly um, covalent. So, if we have hard soft interactions, then these are typically weak interactions. So now let us understand why are soft soft and hard, inter hard interactions strong and hard soft interactions weak. And let us also clarify the question, what makes an acid uh, little or easy polarized respectively, or in other words, what makes an acid or base hard and uh, so, so let us first answer the first question. So generally, species with large donor atoms and large acceptor atoms <coughs> tend to be soft, and species with small donor atoms and small acceptor atoms um, tend to be hard. Um, so for instance, when we have cations, then a higher positive charge leads to a smaller radius and a higher hardness. So for anions, the opposite is the case. So when the anion has a higher charge, then we add more electrons, these electrons repel each other, so that ion then has a larger radius and we get an ion with a, with a smaller hardness. Okay, then if a species is large, then it can nonetheless be hard if no orbitals <coughs> are available for pi bonding. So for instance, when we look at the cesium plus ion, then that cesium plus ion is a very large ion. So the cesium ion is a, the cesium atom is a heavy um, atom to begin with, and we only remove one charge from it. So still we are getting a, 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 a pretty large, pretty large species, but this, large species is nonetheless fairly hard because the cesium plus only has um, um, MTS orbitals available for making interactions. And these MTS orbitals are not suitable for making um, pi interactions with any um, possible partner. So for that reason, it's still relatively hard. Um, on the other hand, if a species is small, then it can be um, still soft um, when orbitals for pi bonding are available. So for instance, a copper plus ion um, is significantly softer than cesium plus, even though it's actually smaller. And this is because the copper plus ion has um, D balance orbitals. And these D balance orbitals can interact with, with anions holding in, um, in, a, in a pi fashion. And that leads to a significantly increased um, electron delocalization. And that leads to a significantly increased polarizability. So, for instance, um, um, ligand, on the other hand, ligands or anions can also have. Um, um, soft properties if they can make tighter actions. So, for instance, C and minus and uh, CO molecules, they are considered soft bases, even though they have um, small um, donor atoms, uh, like in this case, the carbon atoms. And that is because um, their molecular orbitals are such so that they can make pi interactions with um, um, cations. So therefore, they, interact, they prefer to, they are a soft anion, they prefer to interact with other um, soft um, cations. So we'll learn about the molecular orbital diagrams of, of these um, molecules later in the course, so we'll get a better understanding why actually uh, ligand like CO or cyanide ion can make uh, pi interactions. 
But for now, it should be enough to understand that because of these prime actions, and because of the uh, molecular orals these species have, they can make prime actions with the um, um, with a partner. All right. So now let's answer the second question. Why are soft, soft interactions and hard-hard interactions strong and hard-soft interactions weak? So that relates actually to something we have learned previously. It uh, relates to the rule two that we have encountered um, when we discussed the overlap criteria. Okay, so this rule said that large diffuse orbitals tend to overlap better, and that means interact more strongly with another orbital when this orbital is also large and diffuse. And that is because we can create a large orbital overlap area between the two, two orbitals. Okay, and that leads just to a stronger, stronger interaction. So at the same time, um, when we combine uh, two small orbitals, we can also create a significant orbital overlap, and that leads to um, strong interactions. On the other hand, when we combine a large orbital with a small orbital, the well, overlap integral is significantly smaller, and that leads to um, weak interactions. Okay, then I said previously, that um, soft soft interactions are mostly covalent and hard hard interactions are mostly ionic. So why is that so? Uh, so first of all, this is not always true, uh, but a tend, as, as a trend it is true. So why is this so? Uh, that has to do with the energy difference of um, soft and hard species, respectively. So when we have hard species, then the energy difference between the orbitals tends to be large. Okay? So now when we combine two species, where there's a large energy difference between the orbitals, for instance, lithium 2 plus and O2 minus, then it's actually just statistically unlikely that basically the, the, the homo of the donor and the lumo of the acceptor have approximately the same energy, which would be a precondition for the formation of a covalent bond. So more likely, they are actually energetically significantly different, as illustrated here, which would then lead to the formation of a uh, ionic bond. So notice, however, this is only statistically true. It could, of course, be that in some instances, even though both species are hard, the orbital energies are similar. In this case, you would get a, a covalent bond. Okay. Consider, for instance, a boron three plus and an O two minus. They are both hard species, but nonetheless, a, a BO bond still has a significantly covalent character because, indeed, the um, all the energies in this case are fairly, fairly similar. Okay, um, so now what about the soft soft interactions? So when we have soft species, then the energy difference between their orbitals tends to be significantly smaller. So for that reason, it's just significant, uh, it's just, just statistically more likely that the energy of the homo of the donor is fairly similar to the energy of the lumo of the acceptor. And for that reason, you get more likely a uh, covalent bond. So for instance, that's the case when you combine um, an iodide ion with a silver plus ion. So even though you may at first glance think why well, that leads to a strongly covalent uh, so a strong ionic interaction because you combine a halogenide with a metal cation, there are significant covalent interactions 
uh, also present, which can be explained by the softness of the two species. Okay, it cannot only explain by the softness of the two species. There are also other concepts in chemistry that can explain that. But from the standpoint of hard and soft um, acid and bases, we can explain it this way. Okay. Um, then um, let us uh, practice this uh, a little bit together. So let us look uh, at a number of different species and let's decide whether the species are hard and soft. So let us start with a number of number of bases. So when we consider this series here, um, fluoride, chloride, bromide, and iodide, uh, which of these would you consider hard and which of these would you consider soft? And what trend would you expect in that series? So virtual students are also invited to provide suggestions. Yes. Correct. So we would, we would definitely expect that the fluorine, the flu or the fluoride is the hardest of them, and the iodide is the softest of them. And there's a trend of decreasing hardness as we go from fluoride to iodide, and that's exactly uh, the case. So the fluoride is a it's a very small um, ion, okay, due to the position of the fluorine in the periodic table, and also due to the fact that it only has one minus charge. So therefore, the fluoride is actually a quite hard um, anion. So the iodide, on the other hand, well, um, has also only one minus charge, but the iodine is a very heavy, large, large atom. And therefore, the iodide I is uh, quite soft, soft base. And the chloride and the bromide are then intermediate cases of intermediate hardness, whereby the bromide is, well, significantly more on the softer side, and the chloride is significantly more on the harder side. All right, now let us look at uh, another series. Let's look um, at the series H2O, OH minus, O2 minus, methoxide, and um, phenoxide. So, um, which of these um, would you expect to be the hardest, and which of these would you expect to be the softest? So, now in this case, I'm going to give you the answer before because it's not so obvious. Um, they cannot make um, the decision based on this on the on the type of the donor atom because the donor atoms are always oxygen. Okay, whereas in previous series, the donor atoms were well, um, atoms of different chemical chemical composition. So um, generally, when we have oxygen as a donor atom, the species tend to be tend to be hard, and that is again because the oxygen is a pretty small um, atom due to its position in the periodic table. Now, in this series, however, there are still subtle differences because of the way the oxygen is bound to its neighbor its neighbor. Um, species. So when we go to H2O, to OH minus, to O2 minus, then the hardness uh, tends to decrease um, slightly simply because we are adding negative charges. Okay, so these negative charges tend to be located at the more electronegative atom, which is the oxygen atom, which tends to make the oxygen larger. As the oxygen gets larger, the species is getting softer. 
Okay. So now um, the mesoxide oxide is even a bit softer than the oxide, and that can now be explained by the positive inductive effect of the of the uh, CH three group, which dumps some electron density of the oxygen. So now the phenoxide is the softest of these. At first glance, um, that may seem wrong because a phenyl group has an electron withdrawing effect. Um, but on the other hand, there can be conjugation, okay, and resonance structures. So the negative charge is actually not exclusively located at the oxygen, but one can also draw resonance structures in which the oxygen atom is being located also within the center ring. So you have actually a delocalization of the highest occupied molecular orbital that, uh, that donates the electrons, okay? And electron delocalization leads to uh, an increased polarizability, which leads to an increased softness. And that explains why the phenoxide is the softest species within that series. Okay, um, now let us go to another series. Here we have um, ammonia, methylamine, and phenylamine. So we can first ask, well, in comparison to the previous series, should this series uh, be harder or should this series be softer? So the answer is it's somewhat softer because here we have nitrogen atoms as the donor atoms. So the nitrogen atoms are somewhat larger than the oxygen atoms. Okay, remember the atom size decreases uh, within um, a period from the left to the right, and that is because the effective nuclear charge on the respective um, atoms is actually increasing. So species that have nitrogen donor atoms are still fairly hard, but they are not as hard as species that have an oxygen donor atom as a trend. So then we can again try to distinguish the hardness difference between NH3, CH3, and uh, uh, phenylamine or aniline. Um, and you should be able to rationalize now which would be likely the softest and which one would likely be the hardest. Any suggestions? Yes, yeah, so the NH3 should be the hardest and the phenylamine should be the softest. Um, so when we substitute a hydrogen with a CH3 group, then we actually have a positive inductive effect on the nitrogen. So the electron density on the nitrogen is actually increasing. So that makes the nitrogen somewhat larger and more polarizable. So when we have here a phenyl group, then again, we can actually delocalize the electron lone pair at the nitrogen, which actually represents the electrons that are getting donated within the ring, and that increases the polarize, polarizability. Okay? So NH3 is the hardest, methylamine is intermediate, and phenylamine is the softest. Okay, um, then let us go to this series here, H2S. Um, a thiol and a thioether. 
So now these species um, or this series, it compares to the previous two series, should these species be uh, harder or softer? Yeah, I see an answer in the chat. Softer, yeah, that's correct. And the reason is that the sulfur is in a higher period in the periodic table, okay? The nitrogen and the oxygen are in the second period, but the sulfur is in the third period. So for that reason, um, um, species that have, well, sulfur donor atoms are considered soft species. So sulfur containing species are, are typically soft. So we can again distinguish between these three. So again, we can argue with the inductive effect. So as we substitute hydrogens by um, alpha groups R, we well, produce an inductive effect. So there's a slight increase in softness as we go from H to S to RSH to RSR. Okay, um, then. Let's go one step further. When we have a phosphine, would you expect that this species is a hard species or a soft species? So you all know your periodic table now very well. So you can apply this knowledge to answer this question. Yes. It's Sorry. Soft. It's a soft species. I see also an answer in the chat. Soft. Yes. Correct. And we can again argue with the position of the phosphorus in the periodic table. So it's also in the third period, it's actually left to the, to the sulfur. So it's actually even a little larger than the sulfur. So phosphines are generally all soft, uh, soft bases. Okay. Then last one at least, CO. Um, and C and minus, I answered the question about these actually already previously, um, briefly. So at first glance, these may seem to be hard bases because um, the carbons are the donor atoms, okay? So the electron appears at the carbon will be donated towards the uh, Lewis acid. However, as I mentioned before, uh, both of these species have the ability to make pi bonding with the acceptor. And that increases the delocalization and um, the softness of the respective species. So therefore, in uh, contradiction to what it may seem first, the CO and the C and minus, are soft bases. All right, so we have now covered a number of Lewis um, acids, sorry, Lewis bases. Now let us also consider a number of Lewis acids.
So here we have the number of losers, H plus, lithium plus, sodium plus, and potassium plus. So what would be the relative hardness of, of this? Yeah, you're difficult to understand from the distance, but I think you said that H plus is physically the hardest uh, and potassium plus um, is the softest and that's, that's correct. Uh, now, generally, all alkali metal ions are considered to be hard, even if you added here rubidium plus and cesium plus, even though these pieces are fairly large, this is actually because they have no ability to make any kind of actions. Okay. So then beryllium two plus, magnesium two plus, and calcium two plus. So what would be the relative hardness within the series? I think that's very straightforward. Yeah, so the hardness will decrease from the beryllium 2 plus to the magnesium 2 plus to the calcium 2 plus. Correct. So, like alkali metal cations, um, earth alkali metal cations are also considered to be um, hard. Even if you added strontium 2 plus, barium 2 plus, they would still be considered hard, even though barium. Two plus is always significantly softer than the real two plus. Um, for instance, we could also try to compare this second series here with this first series here. So we could, for instance, com uh, compare uh, a lithium plus with a beryllium uh, plus. So in this case, um, the beryllium 2 plus would be considered harder. The beryllium is, as a neutral atom, is to the right of the lithium. So as a neutral atom, it's already a little smaller, but we also have an additional positive charge on it, okay? which further uh, increases, increases the hardness. All right, then what about this series of neutral species here? So BF3, BCL3, BCH33, and BH3. So now, within the series, how would you expect the hardness to, to change? So we can make a decision based on the electron withdrawing effect of the substituents. So if you compare BF3 with BCL3, then the fluorine is just more net electronegative than the uh, chlorine. So the BF3 would be harder than the BCL3. Okay. Then if you compare the BCL3 with the BH3, then we can again argue with the inductive effect of the BH, of the CH group explaining that um, the trimethyl borane would be softer than the BCL3. So in this case, actually, BH3 is the softest species. It's not immediately obvious um, because at first glance, it would seem that the positive 
inductive effect. The CH3 groups would actually make this species the harder, but um, I believe that because of the hydrotic character of the um, H species here, um, the softness or the relative softness of the pH3 um, uh, species can be can be explained. So these three are still considered to be hard species. pH3 is actually considered all the uh, soft species. Okay, um, now let's go to that series here. Iron 2 plus, iron 3 plus, cobalt 2 plus, cobalt 3 plus, rhodium 3 plus, and um, iridium 3 plus. So these tend to be species of um, intermediate hardness. So we have here uh, a relatively high charge on the ions, uh, 2 plus and 3 plus respectively. On the other hand, all these ions are transition metal ions. So the transition metal ions have the ability to make pi bonding to develop your d orbitals, which tends to make them um, softer. So what results is actually ions of intermediate hardness. Okay. Um, however, we can still establish some trends. So of course, we would expect that the iron three plus is hard, harder than the iron two plus, and that the cobalt three plus would be harder than the cobalt two plus, for instance. We would also say that the cobalt three plus would be harder than the rhodium three plus which is harder than the iridium 3 plus. So these three are in the same group of the platic table, um, whereby the iridium would be the heaviest metal, therefore would be the largest ion. This would be the ion of intermediate largest, of intermediate size, and the cobalt 3 plus would be the smallest, the smallest one. All right, then what about something like titanium 4 plus and silicon 4 plus? So in this case, generally, when ions have a charge higher than three, they're always considered hard. Yeah, just because the charge becomes so high, um, it contracts any ion so much so that there is a hard species would result. On the other hand, when you have transition metal ions that have one plus charge, then you consider them soft. Also, some transition metal ions with two plus charge can be considered soft when they are in a higher period of the periodic table. So for instance, cadmium 2 plus is considered soft, mercury 2 plus, uh, palladium 2 plus, and platinum 2 plus as well. All right, um, then let's stop at this point. We have to, uh, up to this point, um, determined the hardness and the soft of species based on qualitative consideration that would be, of course, very useful as you also had a measure to really quantify hardness and softness by attaching a specific number. But this we will then discuss in the, in the next class.